Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight, and we just want to exalt you and lift you up, Father. You are the Lord of all creation. You control all things. You sustain all things by the word of your mouth, and that word is your Son, Jesus. And so we want to exalt you. We want to exalt him tonight, Father. Father, I pray in the, in the name of, of your Son, Jesus, that you would bind the work of Satan as he is a roaring lion with schemes going around. Father God, I pray that you would prevent him, frustrate him. May he not be able to uh, accomplish his will. May your gospel go out in region eight. Father God, I just, I ask for, for your will to be done, your spirit to move in our hearts, transform us. Uh, I ask that through your spirit, the gospel would bear fruit in our life and that you would increase our knowledge of you, both the personal and also a greater understanding of, of who you are. Father, as, as there's a typhoon in, in the Philippines right now, we ask for pr protection. We ask that you would um, protect and spare life and property, Father. We ask that the, the storm would weaken and that there be minimal damage to, to no damage, Father. We also pray for the needs of each of the students here. As you know, the, this ongoing COVID crisis, Father, I pray that you would, you would meet every single need for the students here and that we would trust in you for our daily needs, Father. We, we commit this time to you. May you be glor glorified and honored in what we do and say, and we give you the glory and the praise tonight. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things by faith alone in his blood that cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Okay, so I was tired today, but... <laughs> I have my second win because I have my coffee, so <laughs> I am good to go. Let's go ahead and get into the PowerPoint, and then we will discuss the text. I'm excited, as always, to just learn some new truths. I am learning so many truths, and I hope that you're learning as well. And just becoming more and more convinced in the, that the big story, the, the, the the main story of scripture is really the gospel. It's really the gospel. And so session number seven, the obedient faith of Abraham and God's covenant with him. So we want to look at the obedient faith of Abraham and also God's covenant with him. Now there was an assignment posted and it's not due tonight. If you were able to do it, I was encouraging you to do it just so that you could become familiar with the life of Abraham. But, but, uh, I did post it late because actually I was unsure if we were going to have class this week, but uh, the Lord provided a way <laughs> for us to have it. And so we're here. And so that assignment will be due by this Saturday. So you need to turn it in by this coming Saturday. And uh, if you can turn it in tonight, that's fine. But I, I think most will turn it in by Saturday. So it is due by the end of this week. Uh, and so just an overview there was a, I think the assignment was Genesis 12 to chapter 22 of Genesis. And so we, we cannot do all of that. It is impossible. And for sure, you will leave. <laughs> you will sign off. And so what we're going to be doing tonight is we will be focusing really on just two passages of Scripture in that story. Next week, we may study another portion or we may go on just because... Time is fleeting from us. And so I do think if we can really gain uh, the truths here, I think we'll be in a good perspective to see uh, how Abraham fits in the big story. And, and perhaps we will do a second week because the story of Isaac is, is really a great story. And there's also a lot of gospel truth in the story of Isaac. Okay, so we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. We will also be looking at Genesis 15, 1 to 6. So these are two uh, core passages, two foundational passages concerning the life of Abraham, our father by faith. And so we'll also be trying to look at the New Testament passages. And this is partly why we may have a second week if we don't get to everything. Uh, just such great truths that really when we read the story of Abraham, we cannot read it apart from the New Testament. So there is a philosophy that in, in hermeneutics, in theology, where, no, we don't, you know, in reading the story of Abraham, we, we need to wait to save the other truths until the New Testament. And I want to say, no, I want to say, uh, 
that's not how I don't think how Jesus read the story of Abraham. That's not how Paul read the story. We need to read it considering that revelation that was given to us. And it's not a uh, allegorical revelation. It's not a random revelation. It's what uh, the word of God, Jesus, revealed both in his life and teaching and more importantly in, in his apostle, Paul. And so we will be looking at... Uh, looking at Galatians 3 and 4, uh, Galatians chapter 3, and also Romans chapter 4, perhaps Hebrews 11. So I, I don't know. I have such lofty goals, <laughs> and it doesn't happen. And then we'll be looking at some conclusions as well. So that's kind of, you have the blueprint for our discussion tonight. Let us go ahead and let's get into the Word of God. This is why we are here. This is why I'm here. Uh, I don't want to hear a good story. I don't want to hear someone's opinion. I want to be taught by the Word of God, and I hope and trust that's your prayer and desire also. So if, if you have your Bibles, please turn in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And I have it on the big screen, so I think everyone can see it. I think it's clear. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to verse 3. Foundational passage that reveals so much to us. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, phenomenal truths here, foundational truths. Let's work through this as we have in the past, considering the action, considering God's relationship to man, considering who God is, considering uh, who is the man, what is the, perhaps the purpose, the calling, and uh, also being, con I want us to be considering looking at the story of God's creation, uh, the Adamic covenant, the, the fall of mankind, the salvation and ju the, the judgment of the world and the salvation of Noah, and so I want us to be reading it in those contexts and also perhaps the context of the new testament for the reading requirements that you had so I, i've just given you a lot to consider so before i work here let's look in chapter 12 verse 1 if you were did the reading or you're familiar with this passage what are some of your observations maybe a question you have uh, maybe an observation in relationship to uh, the story of Adam and Eve, the Proto-Evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Adam. There's so many things here. Any commonalities, any differences? Let, let's go ahead. I'll, I'll open the floor up. And if I don't hear, I will call or I will just start sharing. So go ahead. Any comments or observations or questions? Any thoughts? It's uh, I, in yeah, go ahead. It's a big uh, challenge to Abraham, oh, known before as Abraham, to leave his country, uh, his I mean his comfort zone. Yes. Maybe doing uh, so good in his place because he has lots of uh, he has lots of flocks and uh, a big family. Excellent observation. So this is, this is a, so for those of you who are taking hermeneutics, you can start to apply, you can keep your hand out here because we are using that same method. And so this here is a separation. So, so Danny is making the observation that God is calling Abraham to leave his country, his kindred or his people, and even his, so this is, a uh, uh, country, people, and family. 
extended family. This is, and what, what I liked what Danny said, this is a big command. This is a huge command, huge. And, and to, to think about this, we often, we often think in the life of Abraham, we sometimes emphasize the, about his lack of faith, Abraham's lack of faith, the, 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 the uh, Ishmael, right? A A A Abram's <laughs> other son, right? Uh, him hiding his wife and calling him uh, his sister. But this is a huge command. So, it, so in connection with what Huya Danny said, we can automatically identify here that this is a command. So this is a, a big command that is given. What other observations, what other observations do you have from verse one? It seems God personally gave the message to Abraham. There was no intermediary, no messenger, no angel, etc. Direct, it was a direct. Excellent. So this is so we've already seen the word of God. The word of God, where is the first mention of the word of God in the Bible? From from what you've already seen in the big story. Where is the first word of God? This is review. Someone give it to me. Where have we seen the word of God? Any anywhere in the previous context. I am going to just hardline this into you. I will not, I will not let you go. Where have we seen it? In, in Genesis, uh, in the creation. We've seen, uh, great. So we've seen this in, in creation? Where else have we seen the word of God? Where else? In the, uh, during the time of Noah, uh, the flood. And where else? So we have the time of Noah. We have creation. There's one other I'm thinking about. Who was first given the word? And it's in correlation. L look here. What do we have? We have a, a, a command. So where else do we have a command? In the garden. Yeah, who is that? Was that uh, was that Ellen? Yeah. Great observation, Ellen. You're, it, Ellen's in the U.S., so it's early for her, and she's on top of her game. So excellent job. So we have it with Adam. So the, the word of God now is coming to Abraham. It's now coming to Abraham. Abraham is the recip recipient or the or the object, and and the one who is speaking is the Lord. Now, uh, for those of you who have been in my Christianity 101 class, so this is uh, 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 Lord's Harvest Babatnon, maybe Lord's Harvest Lukai, what, what are the three significances of this name? The Lord. What are the three significances when this name is used? What are those three? You need to put this in your Bible. You need to memorize it. This is what is the significance of this name, Lord? He's the master. Okay, so there's this idea of, of lordship. And so I'm thinking of a specific word that we use there, that I've used. There is this, there is this authority. So that's the first. There's authority. What are the other two significances? Uh, 
the the Yahweh or the existing one. Yeah. So the, so specifically presence, the presence of the Lord. And then the third, it's related to authority. God has the authority. He is present. But what is also required in order for God to act? What must he have? A king without a gun. Power. Power. I heard it. Someone said it. Power. We already have presence. So that was authority, power, control. Yes. yes. Power or control. Power, control. Yeah. Great. You're, you're there. Right? Whenever you see, especially in the Old Testament, the Lord, think about three, these three truths. And this is all connected with this idea of God's uh, covenantal name. God's covenantal. So we need to be thinking about that. So when, when the Lord comes to Abram, the Lord is not coming just as a friend. The Lord is not coming just as someone. He's coming as the covenantal God who is going to commission Abraham for something. Okay, so he gives him this command, and he's to leave his country, and then he's also to, to he's called to go to a place that he will be shown, okay? So look at this. Think about this for a second. So, so, so Kuya Danny said this is a big and difficult command. He's to leave his country. He's to leave his, his, his family, his people. Uh, very difficult, right? Very difficult. Very Mahirap, right? For, for me to leave my country, very hard. For you to leave the Philippines, very hard. Okay? Now, does, does the Lord tell Abraham the destination? Does, does his ticket, does the ticket have the destination? Yes or no? There was none. There was none. What? No, there's none. There's no destination. Can you imagine that? The Lord says, you're going to go leave everything. Just go. Okay, get in your car and go. Okay, where are you going? I will show you. Can you imagine the faith? Think about the faith that is required. Get in your because it could be a great land, it could be a bad land. You don't know. Think about what think about again coming to this word of God. He is obeying this incredible command. So it's not a big and difficult command. It is a, uh, it is a uh, very, very big and difficult command. This is like the granddaddy of commands. Leave your country. Okay. Leave your, your, your people. Okay. Leave your family. Where, are you, where am I going to go? I will show you. Just go. <laughs> Think about the faith that is presupposed, the trust, the submission that is presupposed here. So this is the description of the land. And really there is no, there is no description. It's he will show. This here is a future action this is a future action so practically speaking practically speaking we are quick to jump and attack abram for his lack of faith but none of us really have faith like this think about that this is a big faith now look down here you can say ah well 
look at the promise. But, you know, there's a big reward, right? So let's look down. Let's look at verse number two and three together, okay? Let's talk about what kind of actions. Let's look, let's focus on verses two and three. Let's talk about actions. What are the actions here? I just want you to identify actions, okay? I want you to identify all of them for me, and I want you to describe what type of actions they are. So go ahead and anyone, you can jump in, you can identify, you can give me one action, and you, I want to know the time of the action. Is it past, present, or future? So go ahead and give me, anyone can jump in. I will not do it. Will make. I will make. Okay. So, Korea Boy Boy, is we'll that make future? Okay, great. This is an action. This is future. What else? Someone else. Korea Boy Boy's done. Yes. Larry. Yes, yes, sir. Great. What else? Someone else. You will, you will be a blessing. You will So, Danny, what, Danny, what's the one? I heard it. I heard it. Or is that, is that Dario? Great. Of course. What was it? I'm great. Okay, yeah, so, so this is uh, another one here, right? Make, action. Again, it's future, Diva. Right? I will bless, I will make. So, so the will is kind of, the, the will is, is connected here as well, okay? What else do we have? What are the other action words? Give me some more action words. What else do we have? I will not let you go. I will curse, Pastor. I will, I will bless? Curse. curse. I will curse. Great. Is that past, present, or future? What is it? Future, Pastor. Future. 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 Anyone else? I see at least three more, three more action words. Who else wants to try? Who else wants to take a crack at it? Pastor will be a blessing, will be. Yeah, so this is a, this, we could say this is a, a more of a state. It's a state because the, 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 there's no, yeah, we, we could say there's a form of action there. So action or state. He's going to be a blessing to others. Obviously, if he's going to be a blessing to others, there's an action presupposed. Technically, technically, it's a state, but um, let's just make a change here. I'll make a change so that it can be an action. We're not grammatically correct, so <laughs> so we'll just do this. Again, it's future. There's two more. Anyone else want to try? Two more. It's on our Okay, so this is actually an act, this is an an action. Is that is that present or future or e just eternal? Like, uh, there's no time. What what do you think? Present and future. <laughs> yes, it's just it's almost like it's uh, it's just any time someone dishonors. It could be yeah yeah good good. Still two more. Still two more. Actually, there's three more. I I'll finish out here. We have, will bless, bless, shall be blessed. So here's action, future, action, future, action, future. Uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be more of like a, like a present, present future.
Great, excellent, excellent. Now, <clears throat> in most of these cases here, who is the actor? Identify for me the actor. Who is the actor in this, in this, in, in all of these statements here? God. Excellent. Now, let, let's be more specific, Kaya. What name for God should we use? The Father. The Lord. Yes, excellent. We, yes, because it's, again, his, his, uh, uh, his special name. So this is the actor. I, 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 and then here it's not mentioned, um, um, but it's, it, 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 it's inferred here the actor is also the Lord. Now there are several other actors, um, but not there are some other actors, but they're not the main actor. So it's almost just clarifying. So we, we only want to say that here, there's really two actors, okay? In this context, can everyone see this? We have here, the actor is, the actor is Abraham, Abram, right? He's called to go. And then the rest of these this is all the action of, of, of God, okay? Now, what kind of actions are these? Think about this for a second. Someone who, who says he's going to do something in the future, what do we call that? What's the specific word that we call that? You say you're going to do something in the future. What do we call that? Promise. Promise. Excellent. Excellent. So what do we have here? We have a series of promises. Promise one, promise two. Promise three. Promise four, and then promise five. Now, does everyone see, does everyone see what is the relationship what is the relationship between these two? If we obey. It's conditional. Viva. If Abraham doesn't go, the promises are not given. Does everyone see that? Now there is debate. Some people will say, no, the promises were, you know, it was no matter what. But uh, looking at the text, it's a condition, okay? If, if Abraham does not go, he does not receive the blessing. Okay, does everyone see that? He must be obedient. All right. So this is this is in one sense we could say this is uh, uh, conditional, or we could say this is the cause, and this is the we could say maybe the effect. But there's this relationship. Everyone must see that there's a relationship here. Okay, and this is similar. Diba, this is this is the same pattern. This is the same pattern with Adam and also with Noah. It's the same pattern, okay? Now, we're going to get later, I've already kind of, I've, I've, um, I've already kind of front-loaded, I've front-loaded, right? That, that in order for Abraham to be obedient, he must have faith, okay? And we're going to see that is this really uh, a salvation by works or is this also salvation through faith by grace? Okay. So let's be thinking about that. 
But there is this condition, okay? There is this condition. Now let's look specifically at those promises, okay? Number one, he's going to make a great nation, right? Number two, so there's going to be this great nation. So look at the promises. There's going to be a great nation. Number two, there's going to be blessing. Have we seen blessing before and where? Yeah, so originally he was blessed and then he was cursed, right? So there was an initial blessing and then a cursing for failure. Um, and so we, we can say that, uh, we could at least say initially Adam, right? In, in, the, in Genesis 1, I believe it's, um, let me just confirm. I, wanna, I don't want to make a typo, but I'm 99% sure. Hold on. Yeah, so verse... Uh, 128, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply. So there is this, Adam is blessed, and then he's cursed. And then we also have Noah, right? And so we need to see, we need to see this promise to Abraham, to Abram at this time, in the context of God's plan for humanity, Okay. You cannot look it apart. It cannot, be, it cannot be seen apart. This is God's plan to redeem mankind, and we're going to see that more and more. Let's look, let's look on here. So number two, he's going to bless. Number three, your name is going to be great. <laughs> Who wanted to have a big name? Who wanted to have a big name? Did not Eve... Did not Eve want to be like God? He wanted, she wanted to be wise like God. She wanted to be exalted. We could say this is a, for, this is, this is a exaltation. God, God's going to give it. Just think if Eve had trusted and Eve had just waited. How many times have we not waited on the promise of God? Sion, right? So it's so sad. God wants to bless us, and we are so uh, stiff necked, and we want to do it ourselves. So God's going to give promise a great name. But look here. Let's ask the question. Someone give to me. The relationship. What is the relationship between these two? Someone from maybe hermeneutics looking at the passage logically, we're looking specifically at this word. What is the relationship between? Let me just. Uh, Boss. Is it cause? So it depends. It depends. Cause. Is it so? So, boy, boy, which direction are you looking at? Cause? Which way? Yes, it will be a blessing. You will be a blessing. So, the making the name great is the cause, right? Looking back, that's the cause. Looking forward, what type of relationship is it? Result. Uh, yeah, so there's overlap. People will say there's overlap. A purpose. Result. Uh, the name is made great for the purpose that you would be a blessing. And when, and when you are a blessing, it's a result. So there's actually overlap there, Kea. So we don't want to draw a stiff. Sometimes it's clearly purpose. Sometimes it's clear result. Sometimes there's a nuance of both. I, I think that there's a nuance of both here because in fulfilling the purpose, it's becoming the result. Okay. Is, is everyone tracking with me there? But look at this. The great name is not focused on Abram. Does everyone see that? This is, this is other, others focused. God is going to exalt Abram, not for himself. It's going to be 
for others. So what we can say here is that uh, um, uh, Abraham, Abraham will become the means by which God will bless the earth. So a bad reading, a bad reading, my competent is to say, oh yeah, see, God is going to bless us for myself. No, every time God blesses, it's so that we can be a blessing. It's so that we can give. And so when, when God blesses you, when he blesses me, are we, are we thinking, how can we be a blessing? Or are we thinking, ah, it's just, for, I, I, everyone loves me. God loves me. You, know? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it, this is really to bless others, okay? Then there is this promise of protection. Biba, this is protection here. Right? This is a form of protection. Does everyone see that, how that's protection? If God says, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. He's putting a, a hedge of protection around him. People will not want to curse because Abram has this blessing of God and this curse connected with him. And you actually see that throughout the life of, if you, if you did your reading, that people want to get the blessing from Abram. They're, at, they're actually, Abimelech is asking for the blessing. <laughs> you're, seeing, uh, you're seeing families being blessed by Abram, okay? But there's this, there's this promise of protection. And then lastly, what we see here, and this really is coming, this is really clarifying, In you, in you, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So let me ask a question. This is, the, this is the patriarch of Israel. Does it sound like this is focused just on Abraham's family? Where is the focus in, in the Abrahamic covenant? Where is, what is the goal? Let's ask the question here. What Is the goal of Abraham, so we ask, what is, the, what is the goal of a covenant with Abraham? What is one possibility? What historically have... So the, the, the other nations will be blessed through him. Okay, so, so some would say, some would say uh, all nations... Who else? Who else? Uh, the Messiah will come from the will come from the lineage of Abraham. The generations okay. of Abraham. So, so Henry, table that observation. Excellent question. You're 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 somehow reading my notes. So just hang on to that for a minute, okay? Um, <laughs> Let, let's 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 come back here though. So, but 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 this is the first description of the Abrahamic covenant. So, one answer is all nations. What's a bad reading? So, looking at the Old Testament, how else do people answer? What what is the focus of the Abrahamic covenant? What historically, who else and what have they said? You don't have to give me the right answer. Give me a bad answer that some people are saying. Yeah, the 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 the, the Pharisee. The Pharisee, the the Jewish leaders, they 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 trust or they rely. Uh, when Jesus rebuked them, 
They said, our father is Abraham. Yes. So think about this, everyone. Stop and, and pay attention. We, maybe we fall into this trap. People will say, Old Testament, God, God's focus on Israel. New Testament, God's focus on nations. No. <laughs> wrong. Absolutely wrong. We see here from the beginning, right? In Genesis, the focus is on undoing death. In Noah, it's the earth, right? The Noahic covenant gives the common grace to the earth. And here, the goal is not Israel. God only blesses Israel so that through Israel, he can bless all the families of the earth. The goal of the Abrahamic covenant is all families of the earth. I don't ever want to hear from any of my students, ever, that the Old Testament is for Israel, the New Testament is for, the, is, is for nations. The call of Abraham was for all the families of the earth. Think about that. Think about that. Anyone who does not see this focus is doing a bad reading. They're not paying attention to the big story. Let's just take a moment and let's ask a question. Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? I will come back to Kuya Bullboy's question because he stepped out. So let's, let's continue now. So the, the, the big takeaway here that I want us to see, the big takeaway, let me just give, uh, let me just give some, some truths here that I want to emphasize is that Let's come back here really quick. The idea of if we're, we're going to make a connection here, okay? We're going to make a connection here, right? So I want everyone to see this. this we are now going to be making a gospel uh, conclusion, and we're going to see how the story, is not, the story is not changing, but it's merely unfolding. It's, it's being revealed, okay? So let's look here. I'm going to first... Draw your attention to, you have this idea of, of blessing this idea of cursing. And then you have this idea of all the families will be blessed. All the families So what we can say here is this is a new this is a right let's look at the let's look at the proto evangelium The first promise is that the, the seed will kill the serpent, right? That's, that's the big blessing, okay? Now we're going to get more details concerning what that means. What does it mean for the seed to kill the serpent? Well, now we know in the story, now we know that there is this blessing and cursing connected with the relationship to the seed. Right? So there's this relationship, number one, and then number two, it is through the seed that, that, that we're as debat, we're as God cursed everyone. Now God is going to bless the family, right? So 
thinking back, you had Adam, Adam and Eve, they were the first family. And they were cursed. Correct? Everyone agree? So now this promise, what I'm trying to get at is that Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant is a partial fulfillment moving towards a climax in Christ. Does everyone see that? So, so looking at the big story, Do you, you recall, right? Noah, Noah's name was to grant relief, right? To grant relief. So we talked about how the first fulfillment, this is a promise. The first fulfillment was in Noah, right? And, and really you could also include here, Seth. But it's not the ultimate fulfillment. It's not the ultimate fulfillment. Okay? Now we have the next step. Again, partial fulfillment. Is everyone tracking? Is this confusing? Is this confusing to you? Or does this make sense? I hope this makes sense. So when we're thinking about the big story of the Bible, we're, we're seeing how God is redeeming mankind through his called ones. Okay, everyone's tracking with me there? Everyone's tracking? So oftentimes we just think Adam to Christ. And there is a truth there. We can look at Adam and go right to Christ. But, but we're, you're missing so much of the story. Noah has a part to play. Abraham now we see as a part to play. Okay? This is how God has done it. This is how God is doing it. This is the connection, okay? Uh, we're going to go on to Genesis 15. I did want to touch on, uh, back to, to Koyo Bulboy's question on the families versus nations. Koyo Bulboy. And... I really believe that the reason for the promise is this. Adam and Eve were the first family to undo the curse that the first family, now really, Adam is the representative. All families will be blessed in the seed. So that's why I think he says families and not, and not nations. Of course, all families includes all nations, and we'll see that that's really what's being also in but it's much more specific. It's much more, uh, it's all the families. And again, we have to see what, what's the context. Is it all families without distinction? There's going to be a condition, this condition of faith. All families will be blessed by faith. <laughs> we'll see that, by faith. All right. Any questions or comments before we go on to the next important passage in the story of Abraham? Any other questions or comments? Okay, so big story, Adam, uh, everyone, God created mankind with the commission to, to maintain his kingdom, the earth. Adam botched it. He sent us all into death, into wickedness. Wickedness is increasing. God has to judge the world because it's just out of control. And then there is one faithful one, Noah. Noah secures common grace, but not yet the final promise. And then from Noah's line, there's the story of Babel. We don't have time for all that. Now we see that God is calling a man, Abraham. He's calling him to obey, to go to a land where he will show him. And that in his obedience, he will bless Abraham. He will, Abram, he will make his name great. He will make a great nation. And in Abram, all the families will be blessed. So we're getting somewhere. Let's go on now to Genesis 15. 1 to 6. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. So we see now that Abraham is in the land. All the previous passage, we could say,
Abraham obeyed. Abraham obeyed. That's the previous context, okay, leading up. So this would be Genesis 12 through 14, okay? So now, <laughs> notice how before God said, look at, look at the difference now. Is there really a difference in what is happening here? Do, do you see how amazing this is? What is the word that just jumps out at you in uh, 15.1? Looking at how we began the study earlier, what's the phrase that just jumps out at you? Fear not. Okay, fear not, yes. Going back to like Genesis, everything else, right? So there's this command, fear not, right? Prohibition. What else? What's another phrase that jumps out from looking at Genesis 12? What's another phrase that jumps out at you that like, oh, we, we had identified it as a, different, as a different word, but it's also the same. What is the phrase that jumps out, that should jump out? Word of the Lord. There you go. Word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. So this is the actor. The actor. God spoke, right? But we see here, we look at the means. The means is through a vision. It came to Abraham. So number one, there's, there's another command. There's another command here, right? Fear not. Fear not. There's another command. Now look at what is said here. I am your shield. So these, these are, maybe this is a description, or we could say that this is also, it could be a promise, although it's present tense. So uh, let, let's not use promise. Here there's, there's a, a promise, right? This is an action or a, yeah. Uh, this is a state. A future state and this is the description of the Lord so we see already and if you read if you read the context if you did the homework God really protects Abram right God protects Abram so this is a true statement okay uh, but here we have a, 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 a promise Abraham's response pastor I think he start doubting Yes, great. great. There is maybe there is maybe a little doubt here. Right? And we can say that because there's this question. There's this question here, but notice the address is still very respectful. So the, the doubt is not, it's very, it's, he's still, this would be a doubt, but not in an unbelieving, if that makes sense. Maybe a struggling, he's struggling, okay? Let's say struggling, but it's not in the unbelieving heart that we find in Israel, in Hebrews, in, in Psalm 95, in Exodus 17, where they grumbled and complained, right? This is, this is someone, he's, he's in the midst of a struggle. He's in the midst of a struggle, okay? And he says, what will you give me for I continue childless? So he's waiting. He's waiting for the promise of God. Right? So he says, I'm, ch I'm, ch I'm, so, so, so let's look here for a second. Question. Lord, what will you give me for I continue childless, childless? That's the first question. The second statement, 
and the heir of my house is Eleazar Damascus. So he could just say I'm childless, but then he also says my heir is someone else, right? <laughs> so number two. So he's identifying, he's identifying the heir is Eleazar. So he's like, I don't have a child. My heir is someone else. Okay, I understand. I understand, Abram. What, look what else. <laughs> and Abraham said, behold, you have given me no offspring. <laughs> God, you have not fulfilled your promise. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Um, about how old would Abraham have been then? Like, would he still have been old enough when he was asking that to have his own children? Like, humanly speaking? No, so it's really, it's really becoming late. I think I, want, I, I, I could be mistaken. I don't want to speak. I think it was still another 10 years before he had the child. Um, and I could be wrong. I, but, but, he, but they're both past childbearing age. And, and really, really... Um, we can, we can, regardless of his age, Ellen, if you look at Romans 4, it's clear that when this is stated, he, uh, Paul says, he was, his flesh was already as good as dead. <laughs> but he's one who, he believed that God who calls things into existence could do this. So we will go to Romans 4 tonight. We will, we will look at that. Um, great question, Ellen. So really at this point, it's like, it's beyond. It's beyond. It's already, it's entering into the supernatural, okay? Great, great question, Ellen. So th there's this clarification here. So uh, what will you give me? I'm, I'm childless. The heir is my house. Number three, clarification. <laughs> I have no offspring. You've already told, right? So, so there is some doubt going on here. I think there's some wrestling. And in some ways, I really want us to see this is that God doesn't call us to perfect faith. So sometimes we're tempted, like in the New Testament, Abraham will, will read that it just describes this life of faith. And we're like, how could we do this? But here we see, we see a living faith. Abraham leaves by faith. He leaves his, his family, his country, his people to a land that he doesn't know. An incredible faith, right? But then here we see this moment of doubt. And so God... Sometimes we think, man, do I have perfect faith? Do I have the faith that can save? And so it's, we, we, should, we, should be, we should not be thinking that we have to have this perfect faith, that we, should, we are never in a moment of doubt. Okay, and so I, I do think there's this balance here. Abraham is living by faith, but that doesn't mean he won't have moments of doubt. Okay, so I, I want us to be thinking about that because we all experience it. All right? And then again, there's yet this, this fourth clarification here. So really, if you're looking at, it's almost like a, uh, it's two, these, these are two, these are like parallels. Okay. And again, look at this. God is trying to tell us something here. The word of the Lord, <laughs> the word of the Lord came to him. Does Abraham trust? Does Abraham believe in the word of God? Does Abraham believe in the word of God? That's the question. The word of the Lord came. Uh, we're running low on time, so I'll just answer. Action, or we could say state. Really, this is a state. I'll just put state here. This man shall, this is future. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. <laughs> so these are two more promises, right? These are promises here. Is Abraham going to believe? Is Abraham going to trust? Is Abraham going to believe? Is Abraham going to trust? 
Look at this command. Look to the heaven. Look to the number of stars. Condition. If you can number them. So look to the stars. Who made the heavens and the earth and the stars and all that is in them? Who? Who did it? Look, think about this. Go ahead. The Lord. The, Lord. the one who is, uh, who is speaking to him. Brothers and sisters, God's past acts are assurances that he will keep his future promises. God's past acts are assurances that God will keep his future promises. In Abraham's life, yes, he could say, okay, God has protected me so far, but God, the Lord had not yet fulfilled the promise of the son, right? But what does God call upon? His past act of creation. <laughs> the past act of creation. Think about that. Look to the heavens. Oh my goodness, I'm going to go crazy here. What? <laughs> Think about this. There's so many, right? You cannot number them. You cannot number the stars. Now they say it again, whatever. I, you, know, you can't number them, right? God is calling on his past creative act to give Abraham assurance of the future promise. That is powerful. God's past act of creation assures us of the future promise. And so when you're tempted to doubt, when you're struggling right now in COVID, <laughs> go outside. If God can make the stars and sustain and maintain them by the word of his mouth, the word of the Lord came. <laughs> he can fulfill his promise to us. If you can number them, so shall your offspring be. So shall your offspring be. Tim, it is only at this point that God has promised Abraham his offspring. In Genesis 12, God's promise to Abraham that he will be a blessing. Yeah. So it's implied, though, in, in two ways. It's two ways implied. That's why, that's why uh, uh, Abraham is calling upon the heir. Number one, I will make a great nation. So he, if he's going to make a great nation, there must be offspring. Number two, in you. In you, all the nations will be blessed. Again, that's going back to the offspring, the proto, it's so critical, the, the proto-evangelium. Let's go back there. Let's highlight this. And uh, I want you to really see this, okay? The promise for offspring is here in the great nation, number one. Number two, it's in you. It's in you. And this is going, this is, this is fulfilling the proto-evangelium, the offspring of the woman. So, yeah, we, we really want to, and, and that's what Abraham sees. And so that's why Abraham is calling on, that's why Abraham is calling upon, uh, he's asking God about this. Behold, you have given me no offspring. So he's waiting for the promise. He's waiting for the promise. Great question, Henry, and I really appreciate that clarification because that really helps. I Maybe I overlooked that. I apologize for that. But we really need to see that, okay? But what we could say, Kuya Henry, is that he really, God really gets specific. If ever there was an, a, a lack of clarity, God gets very specific. Um, this also speaks to when Ishmael comes in Genesis 17. <laughs> right? This is very clear. Very clear. Your very own son. So, your very own son. This is for emphasis. Your son will be your heir. So shall your offspring be. And look at this. This is what is so unbelievable. 
It's unbelievable, but it's true. And he believed. The Lord and and he this is God, this is the Lord. Counted it. We could say, this is who is there any accountants here? There's an idea here of this could be a uh, they, they, they talk about this as a, both an accounting idea. It means credited. Yes, credited. And because of this, this is also a judicial. It counted to him as righteousness. Salvation by grace alone, by faith, without works. His belief, look at this, look at this. His belief was considered as righteousness, or we could, let's define this. This is law keeping. This is good works. This also clarifies what is implicit in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. This is implicit in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Abraham must believe God before he acts. If there is no belief, there is no act. If Abraham doesn't believe, he's not going to go. <laughs> so this is this is just bad. This is bad. This is bad interpretation. If people are trying to argue that Abraham was saved by works, what is presupposed? And we we get the picture. We get the picture here. This is a microcosm. This is a microcosm, okay? This is an example of what it means. Uh, Tim. Yes. God's promise to Abraham was a conditional promise. Yes. He must obey. It was, okay, it was conditional. In observation, since man has free will, did God gamble himself? Did he? Did God think that? Uh, uh, did God think on the other side that how about Abraham will fail? So do not use, do not use the word gamble. Uh, no, not gamble. Okay, okay. <laughs> reward, reward. Did God ever thought that Abraham might fail? So what will be the? Because we know God has no plan A, no plan B. He's, uh, he has only one plan. And, but he has given man a free will, similarly to Adam and Eve. What did God ever thought of that? If, Ad, uh, if Abraham will fail. You're wrestling. Henry, you are wrestling right now. You are wrestling. So uh -huh. <laughs> this is greatly debated. Some people will say, God took a risk. That, that's, really out, that's really outside Orthodox Christianity. When they say God took a risk, this is actually what is referred to as open. I'm going to go a little deep here. This is for those who want to, if, if, if you're not so familiar, you don't have to really, uh, don't be stressed. But uh, one view will say God took a risk. He did not know the future. And so he gambled. That, that, that's a question, okay? And so those in this perspective, they would be called Open theists. Open theists say that God does not know the future. There is this gamble and risk. Okay, and so um, uh, 
I would, the church tradition, whether you're even a Catholic, they would not have a view of open theism. That's really, we would say that's heter, uh, heresy or heterodox. It's against uh, historical faith. We would say that's not what is taught by the Bible. So, so that's kind of outside. So we would not want to say that God took, took a risk, okay? The, the other two options, and there's, there's a continuum, okay? So there's a continuum. Some people say that God knew all possibilities, so he chose, he looked into the future and saw all the, he's, 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 he has foreknowledge, he knows all. So he looks into the, into the foreknowledge and he looks to see all the different possibilities. He looks to see what man will do, and then he chooses the route where man chooses his way. So that's another option. Okay, and then the third option, you know, um, I will never tell you what to choose. You know, I, I will present my position, and this is something you have to study it out for yourself. I, I do believe that uh, in the Word of God, the, the 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 as the as God as the Word of God describes, uh, the reason why God knows the future is because He ordains the future. Okay. So the way that God knows the future, he ordains it. And so God has ordained it to come into being. Uh, uh, now people would say, oh, you're making God, uh, you're making man a robot. Um, and actually, if you study the word of God, both are true. Uh, man, has, man, man is always responsible, and yet God is completely sovereign. Okay? Both are true. And, and there's an example of this in the life of Joseph. And this is really difficult. You, you'll see this in the end of Genesis. Literally, Joseph says that uh, uh, you, my brothers, planned it for evil. That is the capture and the selling. You planned it for evil. God planned it for good. The same word. So in the same way, in the same, <laughs> in the same way that man is planning for evil, God is planning for good. And so what I would want to say is that um, Abraham was responsible, but God's plan would not, be, would not be thwarted. God's plan would not be thwarted. We can go down that road into the deeper theology. I, I don't think we can answer that question here just because it's so deep and um, we don't have the time. Um, Henry, it or anyone else, if you want, we can just we can set up a time and actually discuss that question, and I can I can go deeper. So we can set up a time where we discuss that. I just we don't have a lot of time here. I think this is a great question for you to wrestle. I really do. I, I really think that this is what we're wrestling with. Um, uh, excellent, excellent thought, because the, you see that you, you, you see the tension there, Viva. And so I think we also can we also can say, wow, I understand why some people have this view, right? Some people have this other view, because that's what that's that's a possibility. Now, again, I would say that's a bad reading, but um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in addition to that question of Henry, the maybe uh, a follow-up question is. When, when will our question be considered a doubt? And when will it be considered a clarification in the context of faith? Um, oh, great question. So when does it transfer from question to doubt? Um, in, in the same way, in, in the same way, if you can think about like this, in the same way, that, um, for example, my, my relationship with my, my wife, right? So I can ask her a question and I can ask it for, for a, in, in legitimate, like trying to clarify. And then I can also ask it in a doubting way. And, 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 and that's, we can maybe use the word skeptical way or a way of, of the question is really not a question but a statement. If you can turn the question into a statement, because you can say, that's a rhetorical question. People will indirectly state a question. It's not legitimately a question. It's, it's meant to make a statement, Diba. It's just not. A, so what I would say is really at the end of the day, that's in our own heart. And so if you are asking God a question and really your question is a statement, that's doubt. 
So there is no black and white. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, going back, team, to Genesis 15. Abraham, Abraham, he believed God. Okay, this is a, this is a question of faith. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. This is, uh, no, 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 what they say. This is a statement of Abraham in faith. Yes. He believed God. Yes. He believed God. Okay. He believed God that through his, through him, uh, all the families of the earth, uh, in this earth, will be blessed through him. Okay. He believed God. So when he asked, my children, uh, it's on my household, a member of my household, that's verse 3, a member of my household will be my ear. A member of my household will be my ear. So he believed God that God will, through him, he will be blessed. So in the culture of the Jew, whoever that stays in his and their household, they are part of the family. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's why that's why I don't want to say it's a strong doubt, because because there is this sense of like Abraham. If, to be honest with you, I think that it wasn't a strong skeptical. That's why I said it wasn't a strong skeptical doubt like Israel unbelief. It was almost like God, you can't really do this. Let's just let's just go this second route. Let me offer a suggestion. Let's let's go this other route. So there wasn't really this this hard doubt. It's like a struggle. There are times you, we've all been here, right? You're in the moment. You're in a, a difficult situation. And you're questioning God, not like, God, I'm angry with you, but just like you're trying to offer God some other option to get through it. And it's like second best. And it's not, you're in the struggle. That's the human nature. And I think that's really what's going on here. He's in a struggle. He's not doubting, but he, but he, and he's offering God, well, maybe God, maybe you really mean this. Just, just, just Eliezer. Eliezer can be the one, right? And that could be, it, it could be. Um, I do think that he, there is a form of doubt, Henry, because he says, you have given me no offspring. And it's clear from Genesis 12 that there would be an offspring. And if not Genesis 12, Genesis 3. In the woman's offspring, the serpent's head will be crushed. And they view Noah as that. So, so this is, this is the story. So, so even if there was questioning, yeah, it's, is that making sense? I don't want to, you can push back. Okay. 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 I, because I'm connecting, I'm connecting the bloodline. Uh, I'm connecting the bloodline, the promise, the promise uh, bloodline of Abraham. Yeah. So the member of his household is a reference to Eleazar. The, the member yeah. of the so it's not, yes, so, but not it's very clear, Damascus, yeah. So this is a member of his household, but not his blood. Not his blood. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I, we will remind Henry the same question. When we were discussing uh, the, the Bethel, when Bethel was in the process of discussion how are we going well shall we proceed to have Bethel and then uh, Henry asked the question I mean yeah uh, where are we going to get the students since our children are already grown up and then he answered his own question by saying maybe we should make more babies and then Haggai was born so maybe in that context in that context Abraham was in the same situation <laughs> you are Abraham in that in that in that at the time, Henry. Plus plus thirty years. Plus thirty years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Haggai was born when Bayan was forty years old. Okay, let's let's go to one passage. It's already becoming like it's eight forty. Let's go to one passage. Let's go to Romans chapter four. Okay, here we go. So, I just want to focus because of Ellen's question and also because of this idea of faith and doubt. Let's just read this. I'm just going to read through this passage and this just explains. So let's just begin. I'm just going to read 
chapter, ch the, the, the whole chapter, okay? I'll just read through here. I'll read slow, and I'll, and I'll, make, I'll make some highlighting points, okay? Because really, th this is just explaining Genesis 12 and also, also 15, okay? So I'm just going to read through here and just highlight as we go, okay? I think that's going to be the easiest. All right. What shall we say then was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and what was counted to him as righteousness. So we literally have... This is what we just highlighted, correct? So what, what I really want us to see here is that explicit back in Genesis, we have salvation by faith uh, or, or, or by faith through grace alone, okay? Genesis 15, explicit, okay? Now, to the one who works... His wage is not counted as a gift. So this is the credit idea. To the one who works, his wage is not counted as a gift, but as a due. And to the one who does not work, so does not work. So this is one who works. One who does not work, but believes in so this is one who does not work, but believes. So look at this contrast. So remember even, even um, the question last night for those who were in uh, hermeneutics about the question of works of the law. Here it's not even focused on the law. It's just the one working versus believing. Working versus believing. Okay. But the one who believes in him who justifies the ungodly, faith is counted as righteousness or faith is considered for righteousness everyone's tracking there so this is the gospel salvation by grace through faith alone no works and this is this is abraham okay just as david also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom god counts righteousness apart from works here we go blessing and cursing Blessed are those whose deeds, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not count his sin. So again, this is the counting, this is the counting metaphor here. So the counting is the sin. He's not counting the sin. He's not counting the righteousness. It's the belief which is counted for righteousness. Is this blessing? For the circumcised? Is this just for the Jew? Or also for the uncircumcised, the Gentile? So number one, Abraham was justified by faith. So you can write this down. Big point, number one, Romans 4. Romans 4, 1 to 8. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works, okay? That's a fundamental truth, all right? Number two, when was Abraham justified? Was Abraham justified as a Jew or before being a Jew? Is the blessing only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised. <laughs> For those doing the reading, had Abraham been circumcised yet? Someone give me an answer. Had Abraham, according to Romans 15, had he yet been circumcised? Yes or no? Not yet. No. Not yet, right? So it's before circumcision. Was it not before or after he had been circumcised? Was it not after, but before? It was before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision and as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. Look at this. Of righteousness, which he had 
by faith. Righteousness by faith, not by works. He's not earning anything. Look at this. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe. <laughs> Abraham is what? The father of who? All who believe without being circumcised. <laughs> all the nations will be blessed so that righteousness will be counted to them as well. So Abraham is the example. And to make him the father of all the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but also who walk in the steps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Abraham was saved by faith. Faith was counted as righteousness. Number two, Abraham was saved as a Gentile. <laughs> Abraham was saved as a Gentile. Think about it. He's the first. He was saved as a Gentile, not as a Jew. Number three, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through law, but through righteousness of faith. For if the adherents of the law are to be heirs, the faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all the offspring. Not only the adherent of the law, but also the one who shares faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. <laughs> so we are children of Abraham. You are a Jew. You are a true a true Israelite, all of us, think about that, the Filipino, the American, we are true children of Abraham. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believes. So look at this, look at this, in whom he believes, God is the God who gives life from the dead and calls into his existence things that don't exist, creation. He is the creator. He is the one that gives life to the dead. In hope, he believed against hope. So this is Ellen's question. That he should be the many, that he should be the, become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken, here's Ellen's question, he did not weaken in faith, when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, <laughs> since he was 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver. <laughs> we just saw some wavering, right? This is where Mama Kappa did. God is not expecting a perfect faith. He is expecting a, a life of faith. The life of faith includes the struggle. The righteous shall live by faith. It's not perfect. We saw that. But it is this lifestyle of faith. The faith of Abraham to leave his land and to go. That's an incredible faith. But it's not perfect. So, so Abraham's doubt qualifies. Because if we only had the perfect example, we would be, you would all look like me. We would pull all our hair out. No, no one could match, right? So we, we, we. We see this balance, a living faith, but not a perfect faith, all right? No unbelief, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it is counted to him, were they not written for his sake alone, but for ours. <laughs> it's not just for Abraham. If you're just reading Abraham's story for Abraham, you're reading it wrong. Abraham is an example. When we read Genesis 12 and 15, we must think us. 
believe by faith. So for us, the word of the Lord has been given to us in a, in, in a bigger way, in a fuller way. There's, there's this command to trust in Christ. There is this command to obey, to live a life of holiness, to, to obey. Are you clinging to the word in faith? And are you following in obedient faith, o obeying outward? It was also counted for us. It was also counted for us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered for our trespass and raised for our justification. I'm going to close on this, and then we're going to highlight and be done. Sin. There are two components. When we are brought into union with Christ, he takes all of our sins and nails them to the cross. We are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I, but Christ that lives within me. So we are in union with Christ. Our sin is nailed to the cross, and he gives us. His righteousness is counted before God. In the law room, uh, uh, the courtroom, God sees his righteousness. There needs to be this positive aspect of righteousness, law-keeping. Christ uh, gives us his righteousness, and therefore we are justified in the sight of God. So there's two components here. They call this the great exchange. It's not just dying for our sins. The Catholics, uh, Catholics will say that. But then their view of righteousness is we have to be perfected through good works. And then it's not going to be done. So now we have purgatory. Because on that final day, Christ just infuses the righteousness into us, but we still have to bring it to the end. And we want to say, no, our faith is counted as our righteousness. Okay? Does that mean that we, can, we have a license to sin? No, Paul addresses that. That's for another time. May it never be. So uh, um, Paul will address those things. But the big point, the big picture, I want us to be clear. Abraham is the next step in the big story in, in redeeming mankind. The whole life of Abraham is surrounding this blessing all nations. And we're going to finish this. We're going to see who the offspring is. We're going to see more of Abraham's faith in Galatians 3 and Hebrews 11, okay? But I want us to see the big picture. So let's go ahead. Let's go to the PowerPoint, and let's just finish some highlights here. We'll be done. We have four minutes, and we'll be done. Significances. The Lord calls Abraham. Number two, God gives Abraham a command. The Lord also promises Abraham several things, but the promises are conditional upon Abraham's obedience. The promises are a great nation or seed, a great name, blessing and cursing, or we could say protection, okay? And then to all those who would, who would either try to hurt Abraham or his family, and then in Abraham, a blessing will be given to all the families of the earth. Big picture, big picture, Mama Kapitan. The goal of Abraham, the goal of the Israelite nation is not for themselves. It is so that they will be the means by which God will bring all nations, all people groups to himself. And so that's why all throughout the prophets and the Psalms, you have this reference to nations. And people are talking about, oh, it's just Israel. No, there's nations everywhere. You go read through the Psalms. The nations are everywhere. The, 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 the blessing, the, the praising of, of the nations are everywhere. In the prophets, it's all over the place. It's a bad reading to claim that the Old Testament is just about the Jewish nation. They are the means by which God will save all the, the nations. Some, some really deep the theological truths. The Lord is the one who calls. Now, I push against this idea. And I really do. And, and if you want to discuss this later, I can. We can. God did not look down the corridors of time and say, oh, Abraham's doing a great job. Let me, let me call him. If that's the case, then at the end of the day, God is not ordaining all things according to the counsel of the will. He's ordaining all things in accordance with what we will do. So he's looking. 
it, we are the ultimate cause of God's plan. If God simply looks down in the future and then picks one of us, it's still coming back to us. We did it. No, uh, God or God is the one who calls. God is the one who calls. And looking theologically, uh, even looking at Noah, God sent his spirit to guide and to, and, 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 and to save Abraham, to give him the saving faith to do what God has called him to do. We can discuss that another time. We don't have time to discuss that tonight. But I do push against this idea that, that, uh, that really it was just, it, at the end of the day, it was up to man. I, 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 I don't think that the scripture will, will bear that out. And, and, and we will have a class. One day we will have a class. We will go deep into that. We will have a class. Tonight, I just want to emphasize, it is God who calls. It is God who calls. The Lord is the judge. We also see this judge component throughout all of the scripture. God is judge. He blesses and curses. The Lord blesses us, but it's not an end to ourselves. So this is for God's greater glory and his purposes. God blesses us not for our own sake. We are, we are to the, 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 the Westminster Confession. What is the chief end of man? To glorify and enjoy God forever. So our, our create, our, the purpose of our creation is not to be a blessing in ourselves. It is to reflect the glory of God. It is, it is to glorify and exalt the Lord. Uh, Abraham's seed was a partial fulfillment in this big story of the promise of the proto-evangelium. It's giving more details. Abraham is to trust in the promises of God and to obey him. Abraham's obedience is a result and not part of his salvation. It's crystal clear. He believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The Lord gives Abraham another command, not to fear and to believe his word. Abraham asks about the promised seed and offers another way. So we can say this, he offers another way for God to bless him. <laughs> he offers another way. Hey God, you know, like Peter, right? Peter doubted, right? He like took Jesus aside. No, 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 Jesus, no, no. You're not going to go and die. No, no, this is not... And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your, 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 your mind on the things of God. Perhaps in this moment, this was Satan. Perhaps this was, in this moment, this was Satan. Satan can tempt us, and that doesn't mean that we're not, that we're not um, trusting or that we're not gods. There is spiritual warfare. God gives a promise and uses a physical illustration to explain it. Creation, when you are struggling to doubt, when you are tempted to doubt, when you're in the midst of struggle, go outside and meditate upon God's incredible creation. It is supernatural all around us. The creation from nothing into existence. God, uh, Abraham believes in God and that belief is considered as, uh, by God as righteousness or law keeping. Big, big. Abraham is a type of Jesus Christ in that his obedience occurs the blessing for all the families of the earth. So because of Jesus' faithfulness, we are blessed. <laughs> no one's earning it. Even Jesus' faithfulness secured Abraham's blessing. Before Abraham was, I am. Wow. That brings on new meaning. Next, Jesus is the fulfillment of that blessing. We will see that next week. Jesus is the fulfillment of that blessing. Abraham is an example of faith for us to follow. By faith. The gospel is not new. In fact, it's already there from the beginning, unfolding before our eyes. And I want to say this. Cling to the gospel every day. Trust in the promises of God every day. When you're tempted to doubt, read the word of God. Read the gospel. And that's all I have. That's, that's the end of the PowerPoint. And so uh, that's it. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. And I hope this was a blessing for you. So we are getting this big story. I hope you're seeing the big story. For me, it's becoming so clear. If ever there was a doubt, it's, 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 it's gone away. And I want to emphasize here, that when you read the Genesis account, 
be thinking that each of these men that live by faith, their struggles, their success, they are living by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. I will close in this, and then we'll, I'll have, I want to have um, Kui and Danny close this in prayer. I want to close in this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first. The Jew, this answers the question, right? The means. The Jew first, the means. And also the Greek, the end result, the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Counted for righteousness. Just as it has been written, since it has been written, the righteous shall live by faith. Danny, close us out in prayer, please. Loving Father, we thank you for this wonderful lesson tonight. Thank you, Lord, for using uh, Pastor Tin to teach us. Indeed, Lord, your word is uh, mighty and can be relied upon. It's, it's unchanging. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your book, the Bible, so that we will not be left uh, clueless on how to navigate in this world that you have prepared for us. So, Lord, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to learn about your word, that uh, we, are, we will be richly blessed and we will become a blessing too to others. And as you have mandated us, that we are able to share the good news to others. Lord. Through this uh, Bible study, we become more convinced and more uh, strengthened uh, that your word indeed is the, the one that we can rely upon. It's our foundation, Lord. So thank you so much for this evening. We look forward to uh, our future lessons that uh, it will really, truly enrich us and we may be able to teach others also through, through this uh, study. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.